Anyway, uh, it's really nice to be here. I hope everybody enjoyed the lunch. Uh, I'm actually going to try to talk about where Canada is in relation to EA. And uh, I'm, I'm using Canada's North as an example that I hope people can uh, relate to. I really appreciated the comments we had this morning. Uh, just some background. Uh, my view is that globally incorporating climate change is done by documenting GHG emissions and the effects of the environment on the project. And that's normally where <clears throat> we stop pretty much in any jurisdiction. Many jurisdictions began looking at climate change to, by, by developing vulnerability assessments and sort of moved these into EA. <clears throat> and uh, I just want to give background that in, in 2002, uh, my company helped a Nova Scotia team of EA practitioners develop a guide for incorporating climate change and adaptation into the EA approach. Background in the north, the effects of climate change in, in the north are greater than in most parts of the globe. Canada's north is a, is a frontier land of, of uh, all sorts of potential, so there's a lot of pressure for development. And uh, there's sovereignty claims in the north requiring Canada to uh, take some kind of lead in environmental management. I'm going to talk a little bit about law of the sea and sovereignty, northern development strategies, the ch climate change in the north, environmental management, public review of offshore drilling and the Baffin Land Project, and what are our barriers to, to doing a better job? What should we do? So just briefly, <clears throat> law of the sea, Canada claims territorial rights to the entire Northwest Passage uh, as internal Canadian territory. And there's an article that uh, in the Law of the Sea that gives Canada exception status for its Arctic waters. And also coastal states can uh, adopt regulations to safeguard waters uh, ice covered for most of the year. So sea ice reductions are affecting the jurisdiction provided by Article 234. Arctic nations uh, who signed on to the UN Law of the Sea have a 10-year window to make continental shelf claims. And uh, <clears throat> that expires in 2013 for Canada. So there's a whole bunch of pressures. This just gives you an idea of the north and what the extended claim is. Uh, in case anybody wants to know, it covers a pretty huge area of, uh, of the north. Looking at the northern strategy, we have a, a brand new northern strategy produced by Indian and Northern Affairs Canada. And uh, it says that the north is two-fifths of Canada's landmass, that natural resources include mineral and oil and gas deposits, no question there. <clears throat> it's on the front line of climate change impacts and adaptation. Sovereignty, uh, the importance of sovereignty is increasing as sea ice melts and the Northwest Passage becomes a reality. So there's, there's a whole bunch of pressures coming together. This northern strategy uh, identifies four concrete action areas for the Canadian government. And one is Arctic sovereignty, one is protecting environmental heritage, which uh, one assumes includes climate change, promoting social and economic development, and improving and devolving northern government. So there's a, there's a whole bunch of things going on in the north. Um, one thing that I found interesting was, was this, that the strategy declares Canada is already at the forefront of several international efforts to study impacts on both the Arctic and Arctic. Um, <clears throat> I think I, I was surprised to read that, but uh, I just thought I'd uh, put it in there so that you could see that governments can say anything that they want to say. This is just, I found this slide one of the most useful to try to give you an idea. This is change in the north. This is the, this is the uh, minimum ice in September from 97 to 2007, just showing you how much it's changed in that decade. And that things are looking from a scientific perspective that this will increase from a, a process known as positive sea ice albedo. So, rising temperature, increased extreme weather, there's loss of permafrost that affects the design and, and how facilities work. There's big environmental and social changes. And, uh, uh, there's, because there's some easier access, at least from a water perspective, there's increased pressure to develop resources. 
So that's sort of the stage of the North, a lot of pressure for development, a lot of questions, a lot of change going on. The Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency we heard from yesterday, uh, they had a 2007 to 2009 report on sustainable development that said that they should monitor success in sustainable development, be innovative and implement change when needed. I thought that was uh, interesting. The action areas <clears throat> for the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency include strategic and regional scale EA, improve coordination, public and original people's engagement, increase awareness of sustainable development and better integration of project review processes. But it doesn't mention climate change. And I think that this is, this is pretty important, the fact that it's not there. Uh, and one of the reasons it's not there is back in 2003, the Federal Provincial Territorial Committee produced guidelines. Uh, and these guidelines tended to do what I said. They, they tended to set the stage for looking at GS, GHG emissions and to reduce the potential risks associated with climate change impacts on projects. Not the project's effect on the environment, but the effect of the environment on the project. And really, very little has been done in Canada since this stage. And I think we can say that this was this was a very important thing to move forward. So what I want to say is that we have this Canadian agency that's overall responsible for uh, the impact assessment in Canada, for research and development, and for trying to provide some consistency in the country. But in the north, we also have other management agencies. We have three major ones. There's uh, a northern settlement area that's uh, over by the Beaufort Sea. Mackenzie Valley Review Authority is south of that. And then over to the east is the Nunavut Impact Review Board. And uh, if we go back, you can see that the first one was established in 86, the uh, Mackenzie Valley Review Board in 98, and the Nunavut Impact Review Board in 96. So these are all relatively new review boards that have authority uh, really vested by the minister uh, <clears throat> responsible for the north, but uh, generally independent review boards for those areas. So we have the Nunavut Impact Review Board. I just wanted to emphasize some of their guidelines. They, they seem to be the most progressive uh, board in Canada. They have an ecosystem-based approach. They uh, require socioeconomic issues to be examined, such as economic development. And they require an understanding of past and potential future environmental, economic, and social trends. And that's really something that is relatively unique in the world for a review board. And the well-being of residents of Canada outside the settlement area must be taken into account, which is also a, a very interesting thing to have in guidelines. So I just want to discuss this huge, huge project briefly because it has pretty innovative terms of reference. This is called Baffinland, the Mary River project. It's a huge, uh, huge mine. Uh, it, a railway will be transporting 18 million tons per year of iron ore from an open mine to an all-season uh, deep water port over an estimated 21-year lifespan. So it's a Absolutely huge project for the north of Baffin Island. A full EIA was requested by the board in June of 2008. It would be the largest in Nunavut history with technology issues such as how do you construct a railway on permafrost that's melting. And uh, cumulative impacts concerned uh, listed included land use, mining, land transportation, and marine shipping, all issues relevant to the project. Terms of reference included climate change impacts on sensitive ecosystems within terrestrial and marine e ecosystems, as well as mean and extreme climate parameters and extreme events. So there were specific requirements in the term of reference to look at these things. Climate change will include permafrost and soils with high ice content, hydrologic regime, as well as marine ice flows, long-term impacts of such changes on the project. Proponents should design and apply multiple scenarios, so they specifically require an analysis using multiple scenarios on impact assessments where these scenarios span the range of possible future climates. So they're pretty specific in what they're requiring. Um, they also require that 
to evaluate the significance of potential impacts on the current state of health and of ecosystems and their predicted evolution, which is really something that's very, very different. Uh, longer term effects of climate change must also be discussed. And uh, they specifically identify a requirement to look at uncertainties in relation to climate change and discussion of the likelihood of all possible climate changes based on various scenarios. Now, very quickly, I don't have much time. I was sort of assuming that there was 20 minutes when I put this together. But in uh, the McKinsey Valley Review Board, in comparison, uh, had uh, uh, 81 screenings and 16 assessments and two reviews. And it, it really doesn't address climate change in that review board. They had a workshop in 2007 of uh, particip practitioners. Uh, it did look at climate change, but at the end of that, the only a minority wanted more sessions. And so in 2008, the session didn't include it. And then briefly, oil and gas development. Canada just engaged through the National Energy Board a large review of uh, drilling exploration in Canada's north. It's really going to be quite a, quite a huge review. Um, the responsibility is divided between Indian and Northern Affairs and the National Energy Board, with the uh, National Energy Board having jurisdiction for exploration development activities. And this is the yellow is the National Energy Board's jurisdiction. So the scope for this board uh, examines hazard and risks and mitigation for offshore drilling in the Arctic. And really the main point of this is it, it, it looks a lot at things, but it does not mention climate change in the terms of reference of this, this 20 and 10 impact. Uh, it's in progress now. The scope doesn't mention climate change. And the focus for many participants is really on the blowout from BP's Deep Horizon well in the Gulf of Mexico. That uh, many of the operational considerations that are of concern in explore, exploration drilling are short term, but the climate in the north is changing unbelievably fast. And so it's really a question of how can you do this review. Only five of 120 filings uh, for participation mention climate change. So only five. That's, those were for all sorts of different groups plus government departments. Uh, of government agencies, only DFO specifically mentioned present and future climate change risks. And uh, there was specific mention by Nature Canada of the importance of strategic environmental assessment, but the way this process is set up, that's really the responsibility of a different department, so it's kind of uh, unusual. And only the Nunavut Game Council suggested with rapidly changing climate, it becomes less clear what threats are likely to compound the risks already involved. And I think that's a very, very important statement. Where are we? Incorporation of climate change in EA has been largely dormant since 2004. And I don't mean dormant, but in terms of changing, in terms of research and development, in terms of doing things differently, it hasn't changed much. We do document uh, GHG emissions, and uh, we do look at effects of the environment on the project. Uh, but things are going to change in Canada with uh, the exploration in the north. They have to. It's an area to really look at. Uh, a focus on cumulative impacts is still lacking. What have been the barriers? Political resistance, lack of research on ecosystem effects, the nature of cumulative impacts, fractured regulatory system, and resistance of bureaucracy because of the cross-silo issues. And overall, we get institutional barriers that include IFIs tending to focus on the viability of a project as, as uh, funders, which, which makes sense from that perspective. Developed countries don't want to impede development and lose a competitive advantage. And the larger institutions, the uh, probably the more vertical segregation of issues. So we do need more consistency. Uh, we need to look at recent EAs and cost benefits of the approaches so that we can actually get some information out there for everybody's benefit. We need to uh, focus on strategic assessment and cumulative assessment. And uh, a research fund for EIA in the north would uh, be helpful. So thanks. <laughs>